I'd like to welcome everybody to this presentation. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Dylan and all, all guys from the Hacking the Box crew who organized this event. And one more time, in the name of all group, I will say that we are really happy to be here. Uh, yesterday, we gave you a presentation, the technical presentation, the technical presentation about RPC DCOM, about RPC Messenger, about low-level low level de details in the context of uh, RPC vulnerabilities. Uh, our today's presentation is not technical. It's not technical, but it doesn't mean uh, it's not detailed. This is a presentation uh, which will try to have some wider scope, some wider, uh, present some wider, more general ideas about security. Uh, I don't try and won't try to introduce any theory, any, any complete, consistent, uh, taxonomy of security myths, which, is our, which are actually the subject of this presentation. What I will try to do during this presentation is to show you some security myths upon case studies of our own experience, about, upon some research project which, in which uh, LSD group participated in, and about these projects which be, became the most popular and in some way uh, well known. Okay, I will start with the Argus. It is probably uh, the first event, the first case when uh, the LSD group became public. It gets good, this publicity have, uh, has good sides, bad sides, but uh, we cannot change this anymore. Uh, the Argus case uh, was connected basically with Argus Hacking Challenge. The challenge was conducted uh, in 2001 and in which we participated. First, uh, a few words about the Argus Pitbull. The main goal of the challenge was to get into the system, uh, to get uh, access to the SAM dedicated system with installed Argus Pitbull and appropriate configuration. Uh, a few words about Argus. Uh, generally, Argus uh, system is additional security level, it's additional protection mechanism which was introduced to operating system. And in order to prevent uh, attacks, which are based on vulnerability on operating systems below from being succeeded. Uh, the Argus was created according to the trusted operating system concept, which is relatively old and is based on uh, mathematical models created in the 1960s, well, like Lapadula models and so on. Uh, what is our main features of the systems? First, it is completely different. There's, there's no general almighty root privileges. There's least privileges uh, rule uh, strictly implemented. The user has strictly defined its role in the system. If he's administrator, he can make backups. He can change some configuration, but cannot, he cannot do, cannot do other things which are which is not intended to do. Uh, basically, this is a system which operates at kernel level. It means that its system is as close as to hardware, as close to the resource which is protected as this is possible. Uh, Upon our experience, we had some experience with uh, kernel protection mechanisms. We had some our own prototypes. We've been working in this field for some time. And uh, upon our, this experience, we can say that this is probably one of the most advanced security systems we have, uh, exp have experience with. Sorry for moving. A uh, few words about Argus Challenge. The basic idea of hacking challenge is a little bit strange for us. Uh, there are two different concepts. First one, like capture the flag here, which is a very interesting experiment. A uh, good idea for different people to check their possibilities, to exchange their knowledge, their experiences. Uh, we have, we had, we have always had, uh, in fact, uh, very mixed feelings about commercial, more commercial hacking challenges. Uh, simple because they've been using for marketing purposes only. They are about to prove the security of the system, which is in fact unprovable in that way. The security of a system can be proved only in a mathematical way, and excuse me, this doesn't apply to this case. Uh, in case of such hacking challenge, like the Argus hacking challenge, the only what could, can be proven is that the system has a flow. And this is basically uh, what we managed to do during this fifth Argus hacking challenge. Uh, the goal of this, of this challenge was, as I said, very simple. We had some system, we had some configuration on the system. The system has our, our protection mechanism installed. 
there are some artificial, some fictional companies created uh, on the system, some websites. The goal is get to the system, modify the web, web pages, explain how you did it, uh, gain the prize, which uh, eventually we, we didn't get. Uh, okay, as I told you, uh, this is the Argus system, and most of advanced, if not all advanced, uh, additional, per additional uh, protection mechanisms are very low level. This is kernel based systems. Upon our experience, we knew that in case of uh, such a system, we, we need a special vulnerability. The goal of such system, of such additional kernel protection mechanism, is to work when typical standard security mechanism of the operating system fails. In other way, if there exists a buffer overflow or any kind of attack, if some set to program, the system, operating system may be compromised. However, if you have such additional protection mechanism installed, this system should prevent, should prevent the flow in the operating systems from being successfully exploited. Uh, so basically we knew that what we needed in order to succeed in such a challenge was uh, kernel level vulnerability. We had to get in touch to this very low level of operating system. Uh, telling the truth, it was quite opposite at the same, uh, in some sense. Uh, historically, uh, we know we've been working with this vulnerability first when we knew uh, what we learned about the challenge. And it was something like this, okay, we, we wouldn't uh, take attention about this challenge in any way, but with this vulnerability, we would, we've been a little bit suspicious. We had an idea, maybe this vulnerability can be exploited. Maybe we, we, we are very lucky that a week or two weeks ago, we've been doing something with, we've been looking at this vulnerability. Maybe this vulnerability can be used in order to bypass this kernel uh, protection mechanism. And uh, in fact, it, we succeeded at this point. Uh, we were, we'd like to sh point something, uh, one issue uh, in this context. This vulnerability, this LDT vulnerability in Solaris operating system was not discovered by us. This, was, this vulnerability was known. It was discovered by uh, Bill Sommerfeld and was uh, published sometime, sometime earlier in NetBSD advisory. Uh, it was an advisory that was pointed that this uh, vulnerability is also available uh, in Solaris operating system. Uh, upon our further research, upon when we pre were preparing the paper about this hacking challenge, we managed to discover this vulnerability also in uh, STO Unixware and STO uh, Open Server. So it was not our vulnerability. This vulnerability were, was completely known. It was sometime it was known for a some time earlier, and still the system was vulnerable to it. Oh, this is basically just a view of code uh, which was successfully used uh, during this challenge. I won't go to any details. Uh, if you ha want to have deta technical details, please visit our website and you can find the technical paper published in 2001 which describes all these technical issues and has all these codes uh, downloadable. Uh, this code is very short. It is really very small code, but in fact, in order to develop to this code, the team w had to dedicate 24, almost 24 hours of work uh, on our own lab with some pitbull configuration installed, uh, with dozens of prototypes, with several crash of the system, and uh, a lot of Pepsi we have to drink that night. Uh, it was something like 16 liters for four persons. So as, as you can imagine, it was... Okay. No, okay, I was lying. So basically, this was this. Uh, this is the final version of this code. Uh, I don't remember which one, which one, which prototype it was. But this code succeeded. In result, uh, we were able to com successfully complete the challenge. We have modified the websites. Uh, we have informed a uh, vendor, the or Argo system organizers of the challenge, uh, who are completely not prepared for anybody, that anybody can succeed in this uh, challenge. But it didn't even have any email accounts installed in the operating systems, like uh, report your, that you have won. 
and we send some, Im uh, send, send some information and sorry, there's no such account. So it was uh, basically uh, very funny and very strange. Okay, but I introduced you to some case study. I gave you some brief introduction to this uh, Argus case, this Argus Pitbull uh, event we have participated in. Uh, and where are the myths? Where are these issues, uh, which are the subject uh, of this presentation? Basically, as I told you previously, the Argus was uh, a system which is built according to perfect mathematical models created in the 60s with mandatory access control, models which have been proven to be uh, secured, which can be proven to be, that can be used in order to, be, to build fully secured systems. Unfortunately, this shows one thing, that such models, creating such models, was not fully justified approach. Simple. Mathematical world is a perfect world, and uh, you can prove security in such a world without any problems. However, when it comes to real world, the real world case is a special case always. It is much more complex. There is much bigger amount of factors that has to be, take, has to be taken into uh, account. Uh, in this specific case, implementation failed. Maybe not even implementation, rather design of a system. The single vulnerability, the vulnerability in Pitbull itself, because of course the vulnerability, LDT vulnerability existed in a Solaris operating system. Yet the Pitbull system had to prevent such vulnerability from being, uh, from being exploitable. So the, P the Pitbull system itself was flawed as well. This system uh, was uh, the system, this, course, this whole case of Argus hacking challenge, is the greatest, one of the greatest examples of what we refer to myth of component security, of many myths and unrealistic expectations which are related to the software itself and, in, and to security software components as a special case. Now a few words about bugs. But security right now and it will be for, probably for until the end. It's all about bugs, about vulnerabilities, about mistakes which have been done at various points. What you should be aware of at this point is that it is all about a complex system. Any software system is a complex system. There are not uh, clear, simple solutions right now. Every piece of software is depending on various libraries, various other third-party solutions, other about operating systems, I will talk about it earlier. The technologies are not perfect. Uh, the errors are inevitable, unfortunately. Uh, of course, there's a great amount of errors. There's, for example, thousands of, er th thousands of errors in security product. Among these thousands of er errors, there would be probably 10 errors which are critical from security point of view. Among these 10 errors, there would be probably one error which uh, will be exploitable in the way that, okay, it is something in common with some security components, some security information, and at the same time, it can be it, it, a, spe a specific code, a specific proof of concept called exploit code can be created in such a way to force system to do something else. Uh, bugs are generally, bugs vulnerabilities are present at all levels, in fact. Uh, bugs, mm, are available at the design level, at implementation level, and configuration level as well. Uh, we very often during such events, such a situation, we are talking about implementation bugs. Yesterday we've been talking about implementation of RPC DCOM. Uh, however, design bugs and configuration bugs are the same dangerous. So we cannot uh, think only. We cannot focus on implementation details. Uh, the Amount of the number of uh, vulnerabilities, the number of bugs uh, on software components is very closely related uh, to the way the software is being created right now. Unfortunately, uh, systems are not creating with the strict, with model rules of software engineering. Systems are creating with very strong requirements from marketing, with very strong deadlines. It is very rare situation when a product is released completely finished, completely tested, compl ready for production environment. This is a very specific case of our information technologies field. 
in any in, in any other field of the industry, in any other field of engineering, the product before it is released has to be perfectly tested and completed. No one, no car manufacturer will allow himself to release product which, for example, won't have some crash test, some uh, security features tested. In software, there's no such, such situations. There's still a uh, lot of work that should be done to software before it is released. Uh, recently, it changes. Recently, uh, the marketing, the um, people, the customers' requirements also has changed. Customers start to be aware that systems don't have to only to be functional, but first of all, they have to be secure in order to be functional. The, the pure functionality without security, it simply doesn't work. Uh, the, uh, the other issue at this point is also the responsibility of software. Have a look at license agreements. Still, the license agreements in software are very special cases, a sort of masterpiece of law, where responsibility of vendor, of creator of software is really very limited comparing to other products. Okay, but let's focus on security products themselves. This, uh, secure, this myth of security component I've been talking previously. Let's assume even that it is possible to create vulnerable back free software. We have created some solution which doesn't have bugs critical from security point of view. Uh, is it perfect? Is it, it is a solution for everything? Unfortunately not. And in the security field, uh, for many years, there have been such, such myths of specific technologies, myths of specific software components as a solution for everything. I presented a sort of examples here on this slide. At the beginning, there was a password. Right now, it sounds a little bit strange, security and password, but go back 10 years ago. Every book that you opened about security has a first chapter, chapter how long should the password be that you should, you should use some digitals, some things, and so on and so on. This is a myth. This is a myth that it was assumed that a password is the most important thing. If you have strong password, you are secured. And this is a very simple, very basic example of such myth of security component, but there are many, many others. Next, firewalls. Firewalls, which are still even introduced very often as a perfect security solution. The only one security solution which is required. You have firewall, you are secure. Perfect. Uh, public key infrastructure, very um, modern, very fashionable technology right now. Again, used for everything. Used for everything. Uh, mixed, uh, in many cases, uh, the notions, the issues of authentication, authorization are mixed. I think considered, they are not, uh, no, these notions are not interchangeable, but they are in practice. Intrusion detection systems, very powerful technology in fact. But the misuse detection approach, which is based on patterns, the detection of known types of attacks, has certain limitations. Uh, it can detect only some specific defined pattern of an attack. And most of antivirus systems still works the same, even if appropriate heuristic technologies are introduced. Uh, anomaly, detection, um, anomaly detection systems, uh, immune systems, these are very promising technologies, but in fact they are not yet. There are some research activities, but there are no sufficiently, product, sufficiently tested, sufficiently effective products which can be used in practice in order to protect real environment. Then, for example, at the end, security token, very powerful technology in the context of e-commerce, e-backing, perfect thing. But, in fact, do, you, do we always know what we are signing? We know what we sign, we know, what is, we know we, that we sign what is presented, sorry, what is presented to us. Uh, basically, what is wrong with all these technologies? Basically, there is nothing wrong with them. Simple, there is no single technology that can all problems at the same time. We have can firewall to limit access to our, net, to, to our internal network. And this is what this firewall, firewall can do and nothing more. If we introduce some intelligent detection module to this firewall, he will perform some additional analysis. If we introduce some authentication using token, okay, we're creating, we are building such, uh, such construction, such system, but it consists of many technologies. There is a unfortunately common myth of 
technology as a solution, as a cure for all security problems. And unfortunately, the re reality is slightly more complicated. OK, uh, we'll move to the second case, to the second case studies, which is also uh, related to the project, to some uh, results of our research uh, that we have conducted uh, in the past. In October 2002, we have published uh, the paper about Java security, about uh, Java virtual machine, about the general design uh, of uh, security mechanics introduced to this, uh, to, to GVM about uh, vulnerabilities, which, are, which we knew about and also which we have discovered during our research on the subject. Basically, Java is, uh, it is a good example of technology which was uh, designed and created in security in mind. It is not so common when we think about technologies which are common around us, which are currently used. Most of them are old technologies, old from IT point of view. Something that had 10 years or 50 years ago, it is an old technology. And uh, most of those technologies didn't take, sec didn't, took, didn't take security into account. The Java did. The Java was created with some security features, with some security ideas, with some security, with awareness of some security uh, problems. Unfortunately, for many years, the Java was not publicly discussed. The security of, was assumed as the security was taken into account during design phase, during creation of Java, uh, the secure. But it's not that way, that security has to be discussed, has to be uh, presented and analyzed by various independent entities. Uh, in this uh, paper, we have uh, found uh, four vulnerabilities and presented other vulnerabilities which were previously known uh, for main types uh, of attacks uh, for Java virtual machine. Ra recently, uh, in June, we have also found another critical vulnerability for Mm, most of uh, web browsers using Java. A result of this works you can find also for website, so I don't go into details right now. This paper is about to be updated probably in a few weeks with this uh, recent uh, add-on to our website. What I'd like to focus right now is some wider consequence, some wider scope of these Java vulnerabilities as we can see them. Uh, basically, one of our main reasons why we got interested into Java and to things like this, that this technology, as well as many others right now, allows to perform what we call it passive attack. Uh, passive attack is, I will discuss the detail, we very often distinguish active attacks and passive attacks. As active attack, we understand attack, con attack conducted directly against target system. Like, for example, the PC, the best case. I have some proof of concept code. I don't like Michael. So I will start uh, my proof of concept code with Michael's address IP, IP address, and get into, into machine. This is the, the simple example of uh, active attack. Passive attack doesn't require things like this. I don't perform any direct attack against his system. What I do, what I do is I force him, for example, in any way, there are different possibilities, to visit my web page, to download some Java applet, like in this case. It can be anything, any, 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 any technology. Then to force him to download into client system something that, something I have crafted. Then this, using this, uh, such vulnerabilities like JVM, the sandbox of Java can be bypassed and some changes into operating system, control of client's operating system can be overtook. And in result, it is not that I will direct attack Michael's machine. Michael's machine will contact with my machine. It will, it will get in touch. Uh, basically, passive attacks, when we are doing some consulting for some uh, corporation, for some banks, passive attacks are always hard to understand for clients. They cannot get it. Why? They got firewall, they got things like this, everything is fine. Uh, it is based basically on some rather flawed assumption. First, which is probably the one which can be defended in some way, is that most security breaches 
uh, are from the outside of the company. This assumption can be defended in this way that if you have healthy organization with appropriate structure, appropriate uh, internal physical access control, physical access, physical hierarchy, uh, you can have control over what information user have access to, who, which, you, which uh, workers you can trust. But further assumptions are not easily to be defended. Uh, the attacker is not always located on the outside. Often we have firewall, often we have limited access to our buildings. Attacker can be inside, can get inside. Especially now when we have a wireless network more and more popular. Wire net, wireless network changes everything. It doesn't mean, is it, is it Bluetooth, is it uh, Wi-Fi, is it some GMS? If we have something inside, we, if, we, if there is some base station inside of our non internal networks, we are flawed. We have nothing, firewall can do nothing in this case. Uh, the attacker doesn't have to be outside. But even if attacker is located outside, in the case of passive attacks, uh, the attack doesn't have to be con conducted from the outside. The attack may be conducted from the inside. Basically, passive attacks, according to her experience, are cu currently the most practical problems, the most critical practical problems in security. To give you an example, uh, if we are about to conduct some penetration tests for some company right now, we usually start with passive tests. Passive, we, usually, uh, we usually try to get some Java attack, Java-based attacks, some attack connected to Microsoft products, some Outlook, some Word, some, uh, some less or well-known vulnerabilities. Uh, usually, specific attacks can be successfully performed regardless of installed uh, firewall, uh, listened antivirus software. Antivirus software are aware about these vulnerabilities, but with slight modification of attack pattern, the antivirus software usually can, can be pulled. Uh, small comparison of uh, active and passive attacks. As I told you, active attack is conducted directly against system. It's much simpler, in fact, because all I need is, some, is a, only a one software component. It's a proof of concept code, which can be executed against a target system. Uh, Against, in case of active attacks, the currently applied technologies can be successfully used in many cases. If we have a properly configured firewall system with some, in, and some internal structure, well, we are protected against external active attacks. However, in case of passive attacks, uh, it doesn't work anymore. Simply because uh, these attacks are more complicated. There are at least three different problems which have to be solved first. There has to be some vulnerability in client system. It, it, have to be, it has to be vulnerability in a uh, web browser, in an email client, in Word, in something like this. Second, there has to be a method to deliver some component, some crafted piece of code. It can be anything. It can be Java applet, it can be a Microsoft Word document. Delivering it to the user and forcing him Maybe just open, maybe just click on it. In some cases, not, don't even click on it. Uh, and the last case, what we need is some intelligent agent, some intelligent piece of software which will get out of this internal network, which will uh, establish connection with some external machines in the way that it won't be detected by firewall system, by an intrusion detection system, and so on and so on. But from the point of view of te from technological complexity, such passive attacks is more difficult. But in practice, from its impact, it's much, much more effective. Uh, I've been talking a moment ago about few problems. One of them is delivering thing to the user. How to deliver it? There's as a lot of things, there's a lot of possibilities. First, there are some clearly technical uh, possibilities. For example, have, uh, s have some fun with domain server. If you have control of domain name server, which is used by a company, we can do everything with them. We can point them to our webs websites. Uh, we can uh, force them to download anything. It works perfectly. Uh, there is a clearly technical point of view. Uh, there is also very powerful 
approach based on social engineering right now, uh, especially in the context of content, on authentic content. Most of people won't resist themselves uh, to open good advertisement, to good offer for new notebook, and so on and so on. They won't resist themselves. And if such attacks, such social engineering based attacks are aimed not at security officer, which will first test it with its own antivirus pro program, but to some accounting lady sitting somewhere, it usually works. Uh, there are many, many methods, many, many different methods. Uh, why? Basically, the security, this passive attacks, this uh, basic idea shows how many factors, in fact, have to be taken into account when we are talking about security management. During this conference, we are talking about technology, mostly technology, but uh, it's not all. Here's very short, here's, here, here you can find only the selected factors that have to be taken into account. Uh, going from the downstairs, uh, first, hardware. We have a lot of hardware. Hardware is not PC anymore. Hardware is no, PDA, cellular phones, uh, a lot of things, a lot of processors which are not aware of. There is a great amount of them. Uh, when, we begin, uh, we, we have be when, we, when we were beginning our computer science studies, it was something like in 1995, we've been told that computer is a piece of hardware. You can always switch it off. And unfortunately, right now, we don't. We cannot do, do such a thing. Uh, many things are strongly dependent on electronics or computers. Most of cars right now has hundreds of processors. If you switch them off, sorry, then the car won't go. And these are all also, this is pieces of hardware. These are, com these are computers. Basically, leaving the hardware level, which we cannot control, we don't know what's going on inside. Uh, there's a software, and software is also a big hierarchical complex structure right now. We have some operating system, which may be open source. Uh, and we, have can, we can have a look in these open source systems, but in fact, we don't have time to do it. Uh, then we have some middle, uh, middleware, some services, some internal services which are always have to be used if we want to perform such actions. Uh, next, if we create some software, none of us is writing software from the scratch. We always use some library, it may be some basic library, but we using other parties uh, software, other, other parties components. In, in other words, if there is a flow in this other parties components, and we are not, we don't have any possibility of checking if there is some such a thing like there, uh, this flow is also present in our product. So, what I would like try to show at this point is complexity. It is very complex situation, and it's, we are still at technology level. We are still very low. Because above this, we have human with their beliefs, with, uh, their, which, uh, with uh, their common opinions about things, with their habits, which are not always good. Uh, we cannot do anything about, we can upgrade software, we cannot upgrade human. Uh, human are also always located in some structure, in some organization. And we are, when we are talking about security organization, we have to be aware that this is structure of different components. By structure, I mean also technological. I mean network design with uh, appropriate systems, with appropriate information located in specific network segments. But also some structure like social relations between specific workers in the company, uh, between both and some uh, sub-worker who can, uh, who can not like the boss and uh, be ready to make some jokes which have, can have bad consequences. What I, like, what I wanted to present here is the general complexity of a problem. And this complexity has specific consequences for the security. Uh, organization is more complex system. And we, as we are talking about, for example, operating system to yesterday and RPC, and when we, when we said that, when Adam, sorry, in fact, said uh, that the operating system is a complex thing. Okay, organization, organization is more complex. There is a lot of operating system, there is a lot of additional components, and so on. Uh, 
the more complex organization, there's, the more difficult it is to secure this infrastructure. Uh, we, all, we are often asked for questions like, I have my secured Linux box. Can you hack in? We usually say, no, right now we cannot. We don't know anything. We don't know any vulnerability for the system. We cannot do anything. But if somebody asks us, I have uh, a network of thousand systems with different users, different locations. Can you hack this? Usually, yes. And uh, it is not that we are special in some case. Usually, it is much easier to get into the complex system than to get into well-secured, small, single operating system. Uh, security of organization, as well as organization itself, is a dynamic organism. The thing that I'm secure today doesn't mean that I'm secure tomorrow. Tomorrow, there may be another exploit on backtrack uh, which fails everything. For example, if there is an exploit in, I'm not, let me guess, checkpoint firewall system, most of companies which are using this uh, product right now are doomed completely. They don't have even ways of acting in the case of emergency. They, can, they don't have any procedures to switch off firewall, disconnect from the network, and so on. Other issues here. Uh, not all components of uh, such organization can be monitored. Not always. We are not, as a security officer, security engineers, we don't want to create things like uh, big brother systems. We don't want uh, watching every people. To designing such things, it has, to be it has to be based on trust, but in trust understood in a reasonable manner. OK, I let myself uh, move uh, to the third case study, uh, the last one for this presentation. Um, basically, previously, I, I have focused on first some technical issues, then some organizational issues. Now I would like to uh, move towards some more human-like, some more general issues, and some myths related uh, to the attacks to uh, users themselves. It may sound a little bit uh, strange, as uh, this case study is RPC DCOM, which is obviously a technical uh, presentation. This is a slide from yesterday. Uh, I won't go into detail. And a few words of reminding for you who wasn't uh, yesterday. Uh, the RPC DCAM was a vulnerability which was, uh, became very famous uh, in July this year with it w when Microsoft published the security advisory MS026. Uh, basically, uh, the reason for its being so famous is that it is a default remote, remote uh, vulnerability, this vulnerability in every default installation of uh, Microsoft operating systems from Windows NT up to Windows 2003. Of course, I mean uh, default installation is in July. Uh, this uh, vulnerability was a specific special also in this case that it in fact allowed uh, to perform such attacks. Such attacks, such proof of concept codes could be easily, not easily, could be created and such attacks could be easily conducted against any systems connected to the internet. And this is basically one of the myths, connected basically what I said previously. Every system connected to the internet. And every, it is every user, for many years, uh, the security field, security research, the vulnerabilities were focused on server side. Uh, most of worms, most of vulnerabilities which are commonly, uh, which were commonly published, discussed, referred to Apache server, send mail, to exchange SQL server, and so on, so on. Upon, after some time, after some time with such situations, uh, the myth was created, and common belief that security problems refers to services, refers to uh, servers, and. Uh, if somebody connects himself to internet, he he's a user. He doesn't make any service to any others, so he's uh, he's secure. And it is generally flawed assumption. Uh, as we presented yesterday, any system operate from technical point of view, any system 
connected to the internet make some services, maybe some internal services, maybe some services for his trusted network, but there are some ser services. And client systems are vulnerable as well as server systems. Uh, this is also connecting with other myths, other clients' myths at the same site. Like, for example, the belief that there's a reason to be attacked. But, in fact, does, bl do bl does Blaster choose anybody to attack? No, it's a mass attack. And if the Blaster, which is, was generally very simple and not very harmful uh, worm, was much more malicious and installed backdoors, destroyed data, it would be much, 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 worse, much worse case. Uh, the other issue is that of OPPO, no reason is required in order to be attacked in the internet. Uh, usually, the reason is every computer system has some information, has some data, and in fact, every information, every data has some value. It may be value of different kind. It may be clearly economic uh, value, like, okay, I spent enough time working on this program, so uh, it's, it's my time. I want to be paid for this, and or, or for example, I don't want it to be released this time. There will be also personal value, like some personal photo and so on. And as this information has value, uh, in most cases, uh, there will always be somebody who will try to get this information. It may be our competitors. It may be somebody who is working on similar project and would like to know what are we doing right now. But it also may be somebody who doesn't like me and, for example, wants to delete my data and so on and so on. So there is always a reason, and it should be assumed that always a reason for somebody wants to make something bad to, our and to us and to our data. Okay, one, uh, two remarks, maybe two information. The information stored in computers and uh, network is very specific. First, it is uh, context dependent. Like I said previously, emotionally uh, information, like my photos, photos of my relatives are very precious for me, not to anybody else. Uh, it is also very unstable. Information, uh, information can be easily stolen, can be easily modified, but also it can very easily lose its value. Let's assume I'm working with some revolution, revolutionary algorithm for doing something, I'm not sorting, for example. And I'm about to p make it uh, publicly available next month, or next month on some security or, or some algorithmic conference. And somebody stole it from me and public make it publicly available a week earlier. I have lost everything. The information, this uh, gratitude for development for inventing of this new algorithm, went to somebody else. My work was lost. The information immediately lost with its value, and I don't know anything about it until somebody else, pub pu somebody else published it. Okay, basically have a look at uh, timeline, t dates, critical dates related to the RPC DCOM uh, case. Uh, this is a very nice thing, because uh, this, in this specific case, some, some some laws, some rules in reference to publishing proof of concept code, this uh, public discussion on this issue, are very clearly seen. Uh, in the beginning, uh, in the middle of uh, July, Microsoft published uh, the advisory. We have reported this vulnerability to Microsoft something like a month earlier. I'm not sure about the date right now. Uh, it was something like a week when a proof of concept code was released. We do believe that in the wild probably the proof of concept code have been uh, even earlier. And it was something like another two weeks when a worm using proof of concept code was released uh, to the internet. What does it uh, show us? Uh, what does it change in fact? For recently, there was a, there's a big discussion about publishing proof of concept code. Is it a bad thing or is it a good thing? How there are some attempts to introduce some standards. There are some proposals of make, making some low changes, some more formal uh, enforcements for standards for uh, proof of concept publication. Uh, the fact is, 
which is not the most important thing. The availability of uh, a proof of concept code on backtrack mailing list is a very media thing, very publicly, very, it, it takes a lot of media attention, but impact of this proof of concept code is not so significant, significant as it would, it would seem. Simply because usually, uh, I, don't think, I don't mean about zero days, I mean about releasing proof of concept code after some uh, advisor and so on. Simply because release of patch, the patch which is released by vendor in order to remove a vulnerability from vulnerable system, is information. It's in fact, it's information about the, the technical details of this vulnerability. And upon such information, about such technical details of vulnerability, a uh, user with appropriate knowledge and appropriate experience can easily create, in most cases, of course, proof of concept, proof of concept code. And in our opinion, there are thousands of such people in the world. So basically, after releasing of patch, there should be assumed there are several dozens of independently created proof of concept codes. Uh, when, uh, in this case, specific case of RPC DCOM, we, did, we changed the way of operating. We didn't publish proof of concept code. Uh, we, did it con we did it on purpose. We simply were aware of impact of this vulnerability. But we are aware that a week after the release, there were several other proof of concepts code. We have received requests from major companies, consulting companies, major groups, major for hints. Not from all of them. The other, the other probably didn't require any hints. But uh, there were several groups, several companies working independently on the subjects, and for sure, this proof of concept code were available in most cases. Uh, this is basically connected, thin, connected with the fact that proof of concept code, information about vulnerability, right now has uh, marketing value, has a market economic value which can be changed to some money and so on. I don't mean about uh, selling, uh, selling uh, proof of concept code, selling this information. I mean simply about, for example, consulting company. If I, if I, if I would have consulting company which would serve some penetration tests for some customers, for me, the proof of concept code for, code for unknown vulnerability is a precious gift. And for a proof of concept code, for example, for a common operating system like Windows is something extremely valuable. Uh, this is basically the reason why we agree, for example, that uh, reasonable disclosure, some reasonable rules should be applied in order to uh, protect, protect users in the internet. However, we are strongly against any form of limitation of public, pu public publication of proof of concept or technical information, simply because the worst thing we can imagine right now is the second uh, flow of such information, when information about vulnerabilities, when technical details are controlled by selected organizations, selected entities, selected companies. It would be probably the worst thing we could imagine right now. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, co I'm coming to the end at this point. Uh, there is probably a point of uh, small disappointment. Uh, at the end, I will want to give you uh, good answers. I'll probably give you some questions. I will give you some questions believing in fact that in some cases, appropriately asked questions is better than silly answer. Uh, during this presentation previously, I gave you examples of various myths. Some of them I called myths, some of them I just presented uh, as examples. Uh, first, I presented some technological myths connected with Argus, connected with firewalls, connected with uh, both technologies which are used in security, uh, but also in general quality of software, like expecting that there, will be so where, where, there should be software which contains no, proof, no vulnerabilities and so on. Then I tried to show you some myths related to wider scope of a problem about security of organization, about complex system, not only technology, but technology of context in, in the context of some company, in the context of people which are using this, this technology. Uh, at the end, I tried to show you some examples of uh, common beliefs, common human understanding of the problems, like, okay, it's not, there's no reason for somebody to attack me, uh, and uh, also about 
some more public things like proof of concept issues. Uh, at this point, when I was preparing this presentation, some questions came to, came to my mind. First, where do, do such myths come from? Because we have such myths, and there is a lot of them. And unfortunately, they are dangerous, as they do create some illusionary sense of security, like a, car, like a security officer which is sure that he is secure because he has firewall, and it, it is enough. He doesn't have to take anything about security. Somebody told him that he is secure. There are probably two main sources of such myths. First, it's misunderstanding, and this source, this source of uh, myths can be forgiven, uh, and, but something, of course, should be done in this case. Simple. Security issues are a complex one, and uh, the other thing, they are new one. Security is a top subject for the last few years, and for many years, uh, nobody knew anything. It was nobody didn't talk ab about it. Uh, right now, for example, in this room, we can talk about some security issues, some security details. But when we are talking about security, it's not only security engineers, security officers, or people which are interested in the subject. The security is also about common people, users, and so on. We can be perfect security officer. We can have everything perfect in place. We have a perf perf perfectly designed network, applied to the security technologies. If you have some, if you have some user unaware of a thread which installs some software which he brought on his disk from house and some friend gave it to him, sorry. It, 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 we, there's very little thing we can do in this case. So uh, these myths which, which originate from uh, misunderstanding of a problem should be dealt with uh, through education, through appropriate trainings of users, through meetings like this, for example. Uh, the other kind of source of uh, such myths, it's probably, unfortunately, marketing, vendors, and so on. Many of, in many cases, when we are going to some companies which have, been, which, have, which have security installed by some vendor or some consulting company, they are always sure that they are secure. Because there came some vendor, he gave, him, he, he gave them some security solution. Of course, usually it was his own security solution, and it was the best on the market. And there is no need for any other security solution, any other independent test. There is no such a need. Uh, this is a bad thing, I think. This is a thing which uh, should also be taught. And uh, also, probably the only thing that can be done in this matter is public discussion, public discussion of vulnerabilities, showing that it is not the, way, it is not, uh, the such situation is a, that there are perfect solutions, but there's always a, there's, there is a component which can solve all problems of security for a company. And basically coming to some conclusion at the end, uh, we are talking about this education. In fact, we should talk about the security awareness. Security awareness understood not only the context of security engineering, IT professionals, but the context of user. And there are a few, uh, few questions. Here are just examples which uh, can be asked in this context. First, what is security? I hope I, and I uh, give you some white uh, answer during this presentation. It's not only technology. Security is more complex, more wide, and uh, more dynamic environment than just pure technological. If, if security was also only about technology, it wouldn't be uh, so difficult, probably. Secondly, who's the threat? What is the real threat? Uh, many cases we find in some papers, some announcement like uh, some kid, 16 years old, hacker, was uh, cut, was caught by attempting to hack into some website and his threat to national security. And it's great, but uh, is he really the biggest threat? If I had a company, which for example wouldn't be security or IT related or any kind of company, I wouldn't fear of, uh, I shouldn't rather fear of kid hacker, but I shouldn't rather fear of my competitors who will, would like to pay a lot of money to get information about my new products, my plans, my customers, and so on. 
So if such a kid gets into my website and modifies it, it should be first a good thing for me because it points that my network, my systems are vulnerable. If this kid was able to do it, probably my competitors was also able to do it. So I have a problem and I should definitely do something with it. Uh, the last question, what security level is required? This is also probably connected to marketing issues, to vendors, consulting companies, and so on. Very often, it's something like this. Companies which sell security. We are, we are selling you secure project. We, we are selling you, after our consulting, your network will be secured. And in fact, nobody can guarantee any security. If we, somebody comes to us and asks, can you guarantee the security for this project, for this? No, we cannot. We cannot guarantee that security level of this project will be higher when we, when, when we make some analysis of it. We will try to increase the security level, but we won't assure any security. We are, there's too many components, there's too many software components, there's too many other components I have been sorry, presenting previously that we cannot make any guarantees. And uh, this is also awareness what can happen. What should be done in the case of happen. As I told you, try imagine in, in such small, small risk, uh, risk management, risk analysis, imagine if there is a vulnerability in a firewall system, what a company do? Usually the only solution is turn the power off because they cannot even unplug the network easily. So it is not an uh, easy problem. Uh, some basically final remark at the end. There do exist myths, and I hope I convinced you about it. Uh, I would even say there's a big methodology which should be at some day deeply analyzed, and uh, each of the myths I have uh, roughly presented here should be dealt separately with. Uh, there are different myths. The, some of them refers to technology, to specific product, to specific application. They are very detailed. Some others are very general and uh, not so easy to be defined. Next, there are different sorts of myths. Misunderstanding, okay, we can understand this. Marketing, and vendors' actions, these are not so easy to be understood. Uh, myths are dangerous. Myths are dangerous because lack of awareness, lack of uh, knowledge, what can be expected, and believing in technology, in solution, or installation, application of specific technology, is very illusionary and very dangerous. And fortunately, uh, something can be done, and this is basically education, this is basically improving security awareness, both of security professionals, both of IT-related people, as, and as I also emphasized during this presentation, of uh, common users, uh, of people which are, have no knowledge, no background in technology, but which are using uh, the technology in every day. For currently, probably everybody uses technology in every way, I I at some point. And these people should also be educated, should also be taught about the threats, about some roles, some myths. And uh, this is basically the best thing, w the best goal which, uh, to which such meetings, such conferences like this serves. And this is a uh, great conference again. Oops. And this is also what we've been trying to do for several years. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how much time do we have. Next one is at one uh, what time is it? Uh, it's 10 to 10. Okay, if there are any questions, please you can ask them now, or are we are also available here for several days, so there should be any problem.
you will have a software product from an OS software application that will yeah, secure as the car industry that we have today. Is it because that car engineers are better than IT engineers or because of the, the because of deadline marketing that they are very big? Okay, uh, there's be, there here are basically two issues. First, uh, of course, car security, the car, cars are currently secure, but the security in cars has also some limitations. We don't expect car to be completely secure. There is something like this, if I'm going 60 miles per hour, then okay, I will get out from this car. But if I'm going 120 miles per hour, then probably security uh, will fail. Uh, so th these are the limitations. And as for the software, I would probably, we've been recently discussing with our group some future trends, some future directions, and we probably should expect a major improvement in the field of uh, computer security, in the field of operating systems, application, and so on. Mainly because it is this uh, shift, this improvement is required by customers right now. Simple. Uh, for many years, uh, functionality was the best requirement. Uh, security as another feature. Right now, uh, upon, upon situations like this RPC DCOM, which are publicly, this is, this, such situation from my point of view, first significantly increases the security awareness. But people right now asking Microsoft, why your software not, is not secure? What, can, what are you about to, to do with it? And uh, companies like Microsoft right now have no other choice like seriously work with security and the proof quality of the product. There's no other choice. So I would expect then in a matter, maybe no, not weeks or months, but year or two, for example, with new long term and so on, security will be improved and most, many, many problems will be solved in some way. Like for example, just slight improvement to client operating systems, like installing personal firewalls with appropriate configuration by default, and uh, for example, introducing a stack overflow me uh, me protection mechanisms like in Windows 2000 server, moving these technologies to long horn to client operating systems will significantly improve the qu security of this product and uh, degree, uh, decrease the probability of successful attack against the system. Okay, any other questions? Good question. Uh, basically, uh, telling the truth, uh, when we've, we've been working with RPC decon vulnerability, we've been surprised in many stages. Like, for example, at the beginning, okay, it works on 2000 and, uh, and on 2000 Windows 2000 and on XP, and okay, well, let's try it in 2003 server, and it also worked. And uh, when we started, when we reported these things to Microsoft and so on. Uh, it came to us that how great damage would, for example, be done by a worm released, for example, a day after the patch. Okay, as I, I had presented you this timeline, it was something like uh, a month for downloading some fixes, for downloading, for installing Windows update, and so on and so on. And uh, even if there is, was such a long time for uh, downloading for fixing your system, for removing this vulnerability, there was more than a million systems uh, infected by this blaster worm or uh, its, its modifications. So we simply were aware how much damage would be done by such proof of concept code released a day after the fix. It was, we didn't want to have on, my, uh, on our uh, such a problem. <laughs> so, so does, that, does that mean that there's one set of rules for vendors like Microsoft and some of the rules for other vendors? Uh, 
I would say this way, that uh, there are some standards, some open informations, some proposals from standards for reporting vulnerability and vulnerability disclosure uh, procedures. Uh, right now, while working with vendors, uh, we are always try to work with them. And uh, we, we, we don't think there's a, there's a need for such specific specified standards like you should give vendor 30 days in order to release a patch, then wait 30 days in order to release proof of concept code. It's not like this. We try to talk with vendor. For example, if micro, in case of Microsoft, they asked for three weeks. For, sorry, four weeks and delivered a patch after three weeks. In case of other uh, vulnerabilities, like recently with this uh, Java vulnerability, there was several months. And uh, OK, this is, th this is this reasonable disclosure. Like, try to, uh, try to establish with a vendor a time, a timeline which is required for them uh, to patch, to remove uh, this vulnerability. Of course, this reasonability should affect as well vendors as researchers. I mean, OK, we can fulfill your requirements, but OK, you should be able to deliver this patch in three, three weeks or four weeks, not three or four months. So I, you will see. This is, this is basically this, the issue which is currently very uh, publicly discussed and very open. And I hope then in newest months, some sort of, I would say, public agreement, I don't, I don't mean a formal document, will be introduced and will be established. OK, any questions? Sorry. OK, in that case, thank you one more time for your attention. and. Uh,